Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Boise. I really appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for my talk on uh, gaming and emotion AI. It's something I'm very passionate about, so I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, sharing some of that with you. Um, just so you know, uh, I've made sure that there's ample time at the end of the presentation to take questions and discuss further. So if you have any ideas or thoughts while um, I'm going through the presentation, um, please make a note of them, and we'll have plenty of time to uh, speak, speak about it further um, afterwards. Um, okay, so unless uh, there's any issues or, or uh, running, uh, uh, you know, uh, items before I uh, dive in, I'm just going to go ahead. So, um, hi, <laughs> my name's Erin Reynolds. Um, and I'm the CEO and creative director of a very small independent game development studio called Flying Mollusk. And Flying Mollusk is most well known for a game called Nevermind, as Boise mentioned. Uh, Nevermind is a biofeedback enhanced adventure thriller game that uh, uses, um, uh, you know, a, a biofeedback or motion AI technology to um, look at indications of fear, stress, anxiety, um, that kind of stuff in the player as the player is playing the game. And what it does is it responds to those uh, feelings of anxiety and stress and uh, fear by becoming more punishing, um, by becoming more difficult, essentially. Um, and so the idea is that, um, and the game is very creepy, it's very surreal, um, and we subject the player to all sorts of intense situations, and the player needs to um, keep their cool and stay calm while being subjected to all of these intense moments. Um, and the idea is that um, by playing Nevermind, the player is actually developing uh, mindfulness skills to become more aware of those internal feelings of anxiety and stress and develop on the fly, uh, you know, stress management techniques that they can use um, and maybe make it into like a habit um, as they're playing the game, and, and our hope is that those same skills that the player develops while playing Nevermind are ones that can be brought into the real world as well, so dealing with everyday stressful situations um, that happen um, in day-to-day -day life. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, Nevermind uh, was released uh, on Mac and Windows uh, last year in September 2015, and I have a trailer for it um, that shows a little bit of context for it. I know you guys can't hear the audio um, from it, um, but if you are just in checking out the whole thing with the um, audio, you can check it out on our website. The link is there. Um, so here's just a little bit of a teaser for it. Um, and uh, I guess while the trailer is playing, I'll explain a little bit more of kind of the history of Nevermind to give added context. Um, it started as my MFA thesis back in 2011 um, at the University of Southern California. Um, and at that point in time, there really wasn't a whole lot uh, out there in terms of integrating um, emotion AI and biofeedback into gaming. Um, and we, just a small student team and I, had to sort of hack together what we could with what was out there at the time. And so we focused on heart rate, um, and specifically heart rate variability to gather um, indications of the stress and the fear. Um, and we used a Garmin Cardio chest strap and an Ant Plus USB stick. Um, and that worked, you know, fine. Um, we got a, a, a one-level proof of concept um, completed in the course of the academic year. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't ideal because you have to put this, you know, uh, cardio stress strap under your shirt. Um, and, uh, you know, asking players to, you know, lift up their shirt to put on <laughs> an extra device to, to play the game isn't really an ideal experience. But nonetheless, we proved that this, this biofeedback, this, um, uh, emotionally intelligent gaming um, concept could work. And so we completed that over the course of a year. We all graduated, as students tend to do. And, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, you know, I took a job elsewhere, other people took a job elsewhere. And, and for about a year, you know, uh, we kept seeing this positive response to Nevermind. People really seemed interested in this concept. And, and motivated by a lot of the encouragement we were getting, I left that job to start Flying Mollusk to be able to take Nevermind further. Um, and so, um, let's see, I'm just going to go to the next slide for now. Um, and so, uh, and again, you can check out the trailer on our website if you want to see the whole thing. Um, we, we spent, uh, as part of Flying Mollusk, we spent the last couple of years basically rebuilding the student version from the ground up, um, supporting more heart rate sensors because the technology has improved quite a bit. 
um, since we started it in 2011. Um, and, uh, uh, and then eventually, um, within, uh, gosh, I guess less than a year, um, we became aware of, uh, Affectiva's Emotion SDK, um, for Unity, which is amazing because Nevermind was built in Unity. And, um, of course, it's really cool technology, so we're really excited about that. But, uh, on a broader level, this was something that was really exciting to us, uh, as developers for, for two reasons. One, uh, this made biofeedback far more accessible than it's ever been before. Um, you know, when you, uh, again, even though we supported a lot of off-the-shelf heart rate sensors um, throughout sort of Nevermind's journey, you still have an extra device. Now, with this SDK, you have access to um, uh, emotionally intelligent gaming experiences through a webcam, something that most people already have. So that's fantastic because it broadens it uh, tremendously for developers and players alike. Um, and then on an uh, even uh, broader level, uh, with this, this technology, uh, games now have the, the uh, uh, ability to sense a wide gamut of player input. Um, you know, with heart rate, you have a good insight into um, uh, what we call psychological arousal, which is pretty much how amped up the player is. But with uh, sort of this emotion detection, uh, you now have insight into things like valence, which is sort of um, the quality of emotion, happy, sad, positive, negative. And so now, uh, you know, this opens up uh, gaming to a whole spectrum of, of player emotion, um, which is huge. Um, and obviously something that I'm really excited about, and I want to talk about all that a little bit further. But first, I want to take a quick step back to give a little bit more context as to why biofeedback and emotion AI is important for gaming um, and why I think it's going to be a, a really significant part of gaming um, in, in the not too distant, distant future. So if you look at the history of games, uh, you know, early back in the day, uh, maybe some of us remember this, when, when games were, were basically, you know, you had a system, a gaming system, and then like a, you know, a joystick controller to interact with it. And you can move up, down, left, right, maybe diagonally, and you have like a button or two to, to you know, press and confirm things. And it's a very limited uh, way of interacting with the game experience, very limited input. And then eventually, uh, the joystick, basic joystick controller evolved into um, sort of a gamepad controller. Um, and so you still have the directional input and then maybe like two or three kind of button inputs as well. Um, so you have a little bit more of a uh, connection to the game experience, a little bit more um, uh, uh, nuanced uh, input. Um, and then eventually the controller evolved further so that there's now more buttons than, you know, the average person has fingers on their hands. Um, you know, which, which allows for even more nuanced, more refined, more detailed input into the game. Players have a little bit more of a uh, controlled connection in terms of how they're responding um, because they have a lot more options of ways to do so. And then relatively recently, we started to see things like gesture input and things like touch input on uh, uh, phones and stuff, swipes and gestures, uh, um, you know, on, on mobile devices. and. Um, you know, now the uh, uh, freedom to interact with the game um, is not constrained to very uh, binary inputs um, on or off. Now it's a lot more nuanced, and there's a lot more uh, ways that players can sort of have this connection with their games. And to me, you look at this evolution, and you see that there's sort of this this uh, this this want and need for a more uh, intimate uh, interaction with uh, a gaming experience. Players want to have more of a direct connection. And that's why I think, you know, uh, emotion AI and biofeedback is really um, key because it now lets the gaming system read the player and, and not only respond to conscious clues that the players can, um, you know, put into the game, but also subconscious cues as well. Um, things that um, the player may or may not even be aware of um, that they're experiencing themselves. And so this creates a much more dynamic two-way conversation between the game system and the user. And I think that's, that's you know, again, if you look at sort of this evolution, that's kind of where things are headed. And, uh, again, I'm really excited because it looks like we finally, the technology is at a point where this can really start happening in a big way. So with all that said, <laughs> so, you know, I get very excited. I tell people all about this amazing possibilities, the things we can do, and they say, well, that's all philosophically well and good, but come on, practically speaking, how can this be really used in a, you know, traditional everyday game? And I say, well, there are a ton of ways, uh, more ways than I think we even realize right now. 
And as someone who's been working in this space for, you know, five or so years now, I have about a thousand ideas, and even still I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface of what can be done. So I want to spend some time really briefly touching upon uh, just how powerful biofeedback and emotion AI can be in gaming. So let's start with the notion that games can, uh, that with this technology, games can just simply automatically respond to how the player is feeling. Um, instead of relying wholly on the player to direct the state of the game by, again, like pressing buttons or making conscious input actions, the game can spontaneously react to the player's given state of mind at any moment, um, perhaps even picking up on elements of the player's mood that maybe even the player isn't aware of, you know, him or herself. Um, so, for example, players could interact with a character not only by using pre-written dialogue options, but also via subtle uh, cues, emotional cues, like an arched eyebrow of disbelief or a grin of approval. Uh, this is a screenshot from a game that came out a few years ago called L.A. Noir. Um, obviously, L.A. Noir doesn't use emotion AI yet, <laughs> but uh, screenshots like these hopefully help emphasize my point that this technology can be very effective and, and frankly, very cool, uh, not just in weird experimental games like Nevermind, but uh, potentially more traditional games as well. Um, and again, just some background on L.A. Noir, there's a lot of interrogation, so, you know, and a lot of dialogue stuff and, and, and games like that or, you know, games like Mass Effect that have, again, a lot of dialogue inputs, um, you know, really could benefit from something like this. Um, or there could be something um, more subtle, such as digital environments blooming and blossoming in response to the player's happiness or becoming more muted uh, when the player expresses sadness. So these are some screenshots from Heavy Rain. Um, that kind of illustrates sort of what that could potentially look like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, biofeedback and emotion AI basically uh, empowers games to dynamically adapt um, on the fly. And so this can be done in overt ways, as alluded to in my previous slides, or in ways that are a little bit more under the hood. And the easiest example of this, I think, is uh, a game's difficulty adjusting on the fly. So. Essentially, um, with, with technology, uh, emotion uh, recognition technology, as the player exhibits signs of frustration, the game can uh, become easier uh, in response to that. And as the player exhibits uh, signs of boredom, the game can become harder in response to that. And this dynamic response to the player's emotional and physiological state can help maintain the player in a state of what's called flow. Um, it's basically a, a fancy way of saying keeping the player in the zone. Um, and there's already been some extremely promising research on this front. Valve, for example, has been working on biofeedback and dynamic difficulty for many years now. Um, I highly recommend, um, if anyone's interested in this, um, that they check out Mike Ambender's 2011 GDC talk called Biofeedback in Gameplay, How Valve Measures Physiology to Enhance Gaming Experiences, um, for some really fascinating insight into their work on this front. Um, and as it actually was a big inspiration for Nevermind in my current uh, work with Flying Mall. So a lot of cool ideas there. Um, definitely check it out. Um, I think if you Google that, um, you'll, you'll find the PowerPoint to it. Um, and then to get really behind the scenes and under the hood, there is, of course, the power of using biofeedback and emotion AI to gather um, incredibly val valuable player analytics. Now, Analytics can sometimes feel like a dirty word, especially used in the context of gaming, so I want to clarify what I mean by this. I mean technology that can detect and roughly quantify what might be going on with the player, signals that are maybe unperceivable to the observer and, and perhaps even to the players themselves, that's gathered in a completely unobtrusive manner. Um, and with that, developers can gain really invaluable, important insight into how to make the experience even more fun and even more satisfying. So, for example, this data could illuminate things like what's giving the player joy or fulfillment or happiness, um, or things like what's upsetting to the player, what's confusing, what's frustrating. Um, it can show insight into what areas of the game are boring, uh, maybe what areas of the game are really exciting, um, and, you know, the list could go on infinitely. Um, and to me, like, that's amazing. There's a lot of good that can be done um, with that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very powerful. and and I also don't want to just pretend that we're not all thinking that there could possibly be a dark side to this, um, to gathering information like this as well. Um, so to that, I say, I think this is why it's really imperative that uh, all of us, those of us who are really interested in making games like this and making experiences that use this kind of technology, uh, really set the example of how to do it right. So 
how to do it in an honest way that doesn't betray our players' trust. Because, you know, once we lose that, all of this amazing technology may never be able to fully blossom. So, so don't lose our players' trust. Don't be evil with it, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and so, you know, these are really only just a few examples. Um, the surface has really nearly been scratched by this, and, and I think even the ideas that we have now are just the tip of a very big, exciting iceberg. Um, I genuinely feel that biofeedback and emotion AI can be applied to pretty much any game uh, genre, um, type of type of narrative platform, um, anything can really benefit from it. It's really only a matter of us using our imaginations and insight to usher gaming into this new era of interaction. To me, I feel like it's really not a matter of if, but when. And I think from there, it'll really truly lead to some amazing experiences for both developers and players um, in the years to come. So I'm really excited about it, and um, I'm excited to hear kind of what your questions and your thoughts are on it. So um, yeah, from there, I'm going to see if I can go to the question mode uh, in case there are any questions. Let's see. Okay, great. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, I think I have the question chat up. Um, let's see. Okay, I see a question that, that's, uh, why do you, do you not use joy or happiness as one of your emotion indicators to determine red, yellow, or green? Uh, Hi. Uh, these are the uh, old questions for the um, uh, responder. So, our oh, okay, okay. Has a, a question at the moment. Uh, she's going to go ahead. Okay, great. Perfect. Hi, Erin. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making time for us. As usual, you're rocking it. Love what you're doing. Um, you. My question is, what sort of expressions um, do you see when, when people are playing Nevermind? And, and can you talk a little bit more about the algorithm? Um, you know, you're collecting all this data. Then what is the logic that you use to then have the game respond to the emotional shape? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I guess I, I uh, um, the best way to answer it is um, uh, kind of talking a little bit about our, our journey in, in terms of figuring out, as you mentioned, the algorithm for um, using the emotion AI for Nevermind. Um, as I mentioned before, we uh, traditionally, um, historically throughout the game, we've always used um, heart rate variability, which gives us a good sense of the player's uh, psychological arousal, how amped up they are. And, you know, our assumption was always that, you know, this would see spikes that the player was um, you know, scared or, cause it's, it's a horror game. And, and so, um, you know, when we're looking at the, um, how does that translate to emotion based, uh, input? Um, we're thinking like, okay, well, we're going to look for things like fear, um, and like nervousness, that kind of stuff. And in testing it, uh, we found that it actually wasn't so much fear per se that, that, uh, was correlating with, uh, the readings we were getting with the, um, heart rate input that we've tr traditionally used. It was more things like, uh, engagement, things like surprise, um, and and uh, upon reflecting on it, you know, and, and disgust was one that really <laughs> surprised us as well, or like disgust. Um, but in reflecting on it, it was actually really a, a very valuable insight into into Nevermind because, you know, Nevermind isn't a game, a horror game where you have to worry about zombies running at you with a machete. Um, you know, there's not a lot of gore. It's it's very atypical. Um, to a lot of the, you know, more traditional horror games that are out there. It's, it's much more of a atmospheric, creepy, uh, uh, mystery game. And so it actually makes sense that we weren't seeing correlations with, with, you know, um, kind of fear in, in the traditional sense. Instead, we were seeing things like people just being like, again, like discussed, like the narrative is very intense and very dark and, 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 and that's kind of the strong emotions that people are taking away from it. So, um, you know, it, that gave us more insight into the game and as well helped kind of form what the um, final algorithm ended up being. So it was a very interesting process um, that uh, was actually a lot of fun to go through. So can you say a little bit more about the process? Um, and then the, we have a couple of questions coming in. Absolutely. Um, so the, the process for, for us kind of looking at that, um, and, and correct me if this isn't what uh, specifically you had in mind um, with the question, but um, is, is we basically built a very uh, kind of rough back-end system um, that would let us have play tests. So the play testers knew that we were getting both, we were recording both their heart rate and emotion um, data, and we compiled all of that, uh, those, basically the numbers that were spit out as part of that, 
and kind of compared it in a giant spreadsheet to kind of look at where the correlations were and and really break down the numbers and and see kind of what uh, what basic emotions um, were being displayed when we saw spikes in, in uh, psychological arousal with, through the heart rate. Um, so it was, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, uh, at first it was a little intimidating because there was like, a lot of number crunching. And so, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, what do we do with all this data? But um, it actually, uh, uh, you know, once we knew kind of where to look for it, the numbers really kind of spoke for themselves. And, and again, it was very, interesting and insightful to kind of see how everything lined up um, once we, we uh, had that program. Great. So we have a question from Agnieszka. Um, are there any other models of emotions in games other than models of boredom, flow, frustration? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, the, the model of the uh, boredom, flow, frustration, that uh, uh, comes from a lot of like basic game design theory, so that's the example I, I usually use. but. Uh, gosh, emotions and games. I mean, that's that's actually a fairly new frontier. Um, you know, certainly in terms of measuring emotion, um, since the technology is is um, you know pretty new. Um, I think that's something that people are are just now really starting to to dig into. Um, in terms of general game theory and and how you know games make people feel, um, there is uh, some research and some academic. Um, Definitions for that, and of course, none of it's coming to mind right now. <laughs> but, um, but there, there is, uh, you know, general theories in terms of games as an artistic media uh, medium and, and how they impact the players emotionally. But again, I think the the really exciting research is going to now be coming out very soon, where people are now taking all of that um, theoretical um, kind of philosophy about games and the emotional impacts it has on players. And then matching it up with this technology that can help quantify that and, and speak to that in a deeper level. So I think um, that's a really good question that's going to have some really interesting answers in the, in the next few years. Does that make any sense? A really a follow-on question: Could a state of immersion in a game be recognized based on emotion recognition? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, for immersion, that's getting kind of back into the flow state. Um, flow, flow is really like when you're you're in the zone. Where I think um, the best way I've heard it be described is like when you're you know doing something that you like and you lose all track of time. Um, you're completely, basically, like completely immersed in it. So whether it's drawing or reading, and and you're just like in the world, you're in the zone. And so um, that that's basically what flow describes. And and I think uh, um, can. Can the technology monitor that in and of itself specifically? <sighs> That's a good question. I mean, it can boredom and, and, and frustration for sure, but that one specific state, I don't know. That's, I feel like there is a way, but mm -hmm. uh, it just takes more time to kind of, you know, figure, pin that down. So again, like I think just, you know, more research needs to be done to, to figure out what exactly that is and, and um, how to find it. Um, what about, uh, oh yeah, so um, can you can you say a little bit about, again, it's related to these two questions. I know you're very interested in VR and AR. Can you say a little bit about the importance of emotion AI in, in that space? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, we, we just brought Nevermind to Oculus Rift. Um, it's on the Oculus Rift store. Um, or we launched it a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, which is really cool. Biofeedback and, and uh, emotionally responsive games in VR. I mean, I, I may be unbiased, but it's it's really cool. <laughs> it's really really cool stuff, and, and I think it's it actually is going to be something that uh, goes beyond just the cool factor. Um, I think I mean in general, I think this technology goes way beyond the cool factor um, on all platforms, but especially in VR because VR is such a visceral experience. It is so immersive that having a game that can or any experience really doesn't have to be a game that can kind of see how the player is feeling to kind of help make sure that they're in a good space while in VR, if that makes any sense, um, can be very important. For example, um, uh, you know, I played my first horror game in VR uh, not too long ago. And I, you know, I played a lot of horror games. I make a horror game. I'm pretty seasoned. It takes a lot to rattle me. And I could only play it for about 10, 15 minutes at a time. The game was great. But it was just so intense, so intense, because you're completely surrounded by this world and the dangers, and you feel like you're right there. And so I think having technology that can kind of make sure that, you know, the player isn't uh, too affected um, uh, and maybe can adjust the world dynamically to, again, keep them in a good spot 
is actually going to be very important as the technology becomes even more higher fidelity and even more immersive moving forward, if that, if that makes sense. Yep, great. Um, this is a question from Diogo. Is there any component which is player specific? So say a player is not very expressive for some emotion types. How can you account for subject specific variability? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's uh, on the emotion side. I mean, that's something that again, this technology is so new for us. We're still figuring that uh, that out. Um, but uh, in general, um, you know, you, it, there is some variance there. Uh, you just try to create it. Uh, I mean, for never mind, for example, people. A similar question is that you know. What if no one gets scared by A&B scares in the game? And sometimes we have a few players who, like, play through the game and they're just like, oh, man, like, this is the most boring thing ever. I wasn't scared once. Then we have some players who, like, play five minutes of it and they're like, this is way too intense. I can't handle it. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, emotion variability there. And so you just try to create – we try to create an experience where there's at least something for everybody in there. Um, and so on the game development side, that's, I guess, one particular approach to it. But in terms of the user um, – you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's very hard to account for. We're still figuring out kind of those things. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's a question that I think we'll, we'll need to continue to think about as this technology okay. develops. Well, what about opt in? So you're asking people to turn the camera on while they're playing. What, 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 what sort of reactions have you gotten to that? I think we, we make for, for never mind, we make it pretty clear, you know, how the game works. And so I think people wouldn't be, launching it up unless they, you know, were already kind of on board for um, the the experience that's going to be. Um, but I think, I, and we don't, like, save any of that data that is gathering the biofeedback data. It's pretty much it, it reads it and then throws it out um, completely. So, um, you know, it's very personal. It's local to the machine. Um, but I think anything that so – basically what I'm saying is that, that, like, players know what they're getting into. We're very transparent with how this is being used. Um, and uh, – and, and I think that's really what's key to it. So if there's something where, like, the data is being um, recorded and sent to a server somewhere, I, you know, I think you just need to make sure that players know and, and or, you know, users, if it's, if it's not a game, um, know exactly what they're getting into. Um, you know, and I think I think it's just honesty and transparency in our, our experience is really, you know, as long as you have that, people seem to be on board um, for it. Uh, it's when you start raising questions as to how this is being used that people start to, um, you know, you know, rightfully be suspicious <laughs> of what might be going on. Very cool. Um, and then maybe a final question for you, Erin. I know that you are very passionate about um, kind of what biofeedback games can bring to people and how it can be applied in, in health and, and mindfulness. So can you, can you say a little bit about your vision there? Yeah. So, I, I mean, my, my – um, uh, you know, I'm really passionate about games that, that give back to players, um, games that uh, entertain but also benefit. And I think, you know, biofeedback and emotion AI is sort of the perfect um, uh, uh, complement to those kind of games because it, it creates a really dynamic experience that can uh, optimize the, the gameplay experience for players. So, for example, like Nevermind, of course, we have the game responding in real time to a sensation of anxiety and stress and and um, that creates sort of this, this awareness of what's going on. You know, the players playing the game, they might feel um, some tension in their shoulders that maybe they've just learned over the years to ignore. But when they see that accompanied by the game starting to respond, uh, you know, to those feelings, then you start to rebuild those linkage uh, links, um, you know, that, that, like, internal kind of connection of, like, oh, man, the tightness in my shoulder means I'm getting stressed. You know, what do I do about it? Do I take deep breaths? And then, you know, when you figure out what does work for you, thinking about the ocean, looking at cat photos, whatever it may be, and see the game relax and become uh, more forgiving, it sort of creates this positive reinforcement, like this is actually doing something. This is physiologically helping me. Um, you know, I think the same could be said for educational games, you know, games that can see how, um, you know, the user's responding to a topic. Are they confused? Are they engaged? Uh, are they excited? Are they bored? And adjust accordingly. I think there's a lot of that can be done there. So, I mean, again, like the, the options, I could go on for like an hour for just like all the different ways it can work. But um, the short answer is, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think um, you know, the two kind of go hand in hand for sure. Great. Well, um, oh, wait, we do have a couple more questions. Um, you 
provide a review or feedback to players about how they're managing stress and anxiety over time, like maybe a weekly review or tips on how to handle both life and pain, stress and anxiety. That's and, a, then, okay. and then are there physiological, well, let's, let's finish that first. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. We don't right now, um, but it's something that we really want to do. In fact, one of our visions for Nevermind is to create a branch of the current version that you can download on Steam. Um, we call that the commercial version. Um, so branch that and create an adaptation of that that's a therapeutic version that can be potentially used in clinical settings. Um, and those are the kind of features we especially want to build out for that version of the game. So I think it's a great idea and it's something we've been talking about for a while. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, one last question. Are physiological signals able to reveal information on valence of an emotional state? That's also a really good question. So in our experience, um, you know, that we use heart rate as sort of the physiological uh, input for Nevermind. And uh, heart rate and heart rate variability is really good at uh, psychological arousal. So how amped up are you? Are you kind of like, eh, or are you like, oh my God, the most amazing thing's happening, or I'm so freaked out. Um, and so it's really good at, at measuring that. Uh, it's not so great at measuring valence. So we have no idea um, if the player, if we see a spike um, in the arousal, if that's because the player is like really excited or if they're really freaked out. And so we'd actually get these false positives um, in the game sometimes where like the player would be at the end of this really frustrating maze and we see the spike um, in, in what we thought would, you know, what the game thinks is a fear reaction. And like, well, there's nothing scary going on there. So why are we seeing this consistent spike? Um, this is like in play tests and, and stuff while we're developing it. Um, and uh, we realized that it, it wasn't fear. It was excitement that the player was at the end of this thing and they're like done with it. Um, so I think that's where, you know, uh, partnering physiological biofeedback with um, sort of this more emotion-based biofeedback is really great because emotion is fantastic at getting valence. So, for example, in Nevermind, now the game knows when it sees a spike, it can tell, like, is this because the player is really excited or is it because the player is freaking out? And then it can respond in a much more accurate way uh, accordingly. That's awesome. Thank you, Erin, so much again. You can reach Erin on Twitter at ReynoldsPhobia. Um, mm -hmm. And thanks again for, for being part of this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's also exciting stuff. And uh, I uh, look forward to listening to the rest of the webinar.